in so many ways, as a super organism, they're almost a warm-blooded mammal. And as individuals, they're not. Hi, Mike James here, the host of Hive Time. Uh, today I have on uh, Michael Bush. He is a experienced beekeeper as well as an author and a speaker. Uh, loves pretty much everything bees. We sit down for a really long talk. I ended up having to split into two different episodes. So if you could, um, before you before we jump into this, if you could hit the subscribe button right down here, and then there's a like button right here. Uh, really helps us out, and um, let us know if you got any comments as well. So let's get started, and don't forget there is a second part to this. Well, we've talked about everything but bees and IT. Well, we've talked a lot IT, a lot. So, a little. A little. So, yeah, we, we can get into bees here. Yeah, so what? Um, how, how did you get into bees? When did you get into bees? Uh, it sounds like you've been doing it quite a while. So I, I just didn't really drill down to see how you started and how you got into it. <clears throat> well, I think like a lot of people about my age, I, I really wanted a homestead. I mean, the world was a complex place and I much preferred to directly meet my own needs. And I, I really wanted a homestead, it's really what I've wanted to do all my life, ever since I was a little kid. The society as a whole seems too uh, abstract. Anyway, um, I tried gardening and I wasn't very good at it. I suppose I might be able to get good at it, but I wasn't good at it. So. Um, the other thing is, if you want a homestead, you really need to own land. I mean, and you, you don't need, you can't be making payments on it or you don't have time to homestead. You're busy working to pay the payments. So the nice thing about beekeeping is you can put it on other people's land and you don't necessarily have to have them all on your land. So you can put a couple in the backyard, but you can put some more out on somebody else's place and some more on somebody else's place and some more on somebody else's place. And you can have quite a few beehives and not own any land. Um, and I liked, I liked honey and I was under the foolish expectation that I was going to get free honey out of it, which eventually you get honey, but I don't, I wouldn't call it free <laughs> Right. <laughs> by the time you buy all the equipment and you do all the work. Um, there's a, there's an interesting story in one of Jay Smith's books. Um, he talks about, he was on a train and the conductor found out he was a beekeeper and the conductor was like, yeah, I, I think I'm going to retire and, and do that. I'll just get a bunch of beehives and then the bees will do all the work and, and I can just sell the honey. And, and uh, Jay Smith says, you just think you have a job now. You think you're working now. You wait till you have 100 beehives. And then you'll have to work. Um, so, yeah, I think that, that that's maybe a misnomer, but, but you, get, you get bees and they're addicting is the problem. And nobody warned me they were addicting. I, I, I keep meaning to write a book on bee fever just to talk about the addiction of beekeeping because I, I actually warn my, I have interns that come every year to do work and I warn them if they're not into bees, you can walk away now, but once you're addicted, <laughs> there's no walking away from it. Yeah. And it's an addiction that costs you money. <laughs> exactly. And it, and it consumes your life. I mean, right. And, and I think it's in a good way, but you, but you need to make that decision rationally before you're addicted, I think maybe. Um, so yeah, it is pretty addicting. It was 1974 when I first got into bees. I suppose I started reading about it before that, but, uh, and they were just so fascinating. I mean, the, the, everything about them is so fascinating. The way they'll take the inside of a rotting tree and propolize the whole inside of it into this this nice place to live and then build all this comb and then um and and raise their brood and and they're in, in so many ways as a super organism they're almost a warm-blooded mammal and as individuals they're not as individuals they're cold-blooded but it, it well that's hard to say if they're cold-blooded they can generate heat right. so it's not like they but they but they're limited on their ability to generate heat and in the cold, they often die, but as a group, they're actually warm and they, they produce milk that they feed their young. They, they, they're just in so many ways, uh, a mammal <laughs> yeah. as a super organism. So anyway, um, they're just fascinating. And I, and the more I, 
I, I get obsessed with almost anything I get into because uh, if it interests me enough to get into it, I want to know everything there is to know about it. And one of the things about bees is you never get to the end of what there is to know about them. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I, I feel like it gets almost more and more convoluted and complicated the exactly. more we know. You thought it was simple when you knew nothing about them. <laughs> right, right, right. Now, right. now, 48 years later, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> right. That it is. Um, and I, I was watching a video that you'd done, or I, I don't know necessarily that you'd done it, but uh, um, you spoke at a beekeepers um, associations event and they YouTubed it. And one of the things that I found fascinating was, you know, kind of how you talked about even the, the gene pool of, 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 of itself within the bees and how, how, how even complex that is. And I don't think a lot of beekeepers I mean, I think they know about it, but I don't think they really think too much about it in regards to how, I mean, you think, you know, when you're buying your bees, you're thinking, you know, I want them gentle, I want them productive, um, and then I want this specific bee bee because they, you know, they're cold hardy or, you know, warm tolerant and so on and so forth, but it's so much deeper than that. Um, and, and that's where I think it, it starts to get very complicated. Yeah, well, but I think the thing most beekeepers don't think about, they might know it or they might not know it, but the, the genetics, the genetics of a colony is complex because you've got a queen, that's one side of all the genetics of all the workers, and then you've got all the drones she mated with, and people don't always think through the fact that a, all of the sperm from a given drone are identical. They only have one set of genes. They don't have two. They're they're haploid, not diploid. So there's only one set of genes. So all the offspring from that drone, one side of their genetics is identical. So if you think about, you know, mammals or or whatever, anything that's always diploid, um, you you think siblings are pretty closely related, but actually siblings are not that closely related because they get a random set from their mother and a random set from their father, they could actually not have a single gene in common. That's unlikely, but it's actually possible that, that this, the set they got is an entirely different set than the set that their sibling got. Um, they could actually have not a single gene in common. Like I said, unlikely, but it's possible. And all of them only have maybe, you know, at, at most um, half of their genes in common, most likely. Um, at the most, and yeah. probably they're somewhere in between, you know, three, maybe a fourth of their genes in common. But but now you've got a drone whose all all of their sperm is identical. Then all of the that subfamily, which is what you'd call all the ones from that drone or the subfamily, all the one side is identical, and the other side's a mixture. So most of them are somewhere between three fourths and and possibly 100% the same. Um, so they're much more closely related than a, than a sibling, than a brother and sister that have the same mother and father. They're more closely related than that. So, so what about the, the drones that come from the exact same hive? And, and I understand that you know the queen has been inseminated with multiple drones, likely. Um, we'll just, for math purposes, we'll call it 10. 10, 10 different drones made it with her. Is there would then 10% of the um, drones within that hive then be genetically identical or is it just within no, that individual totally drone? They're not gonna be totally genetically identical, they're gonna, but they're gonna be a subfamily just like the workers are a subfamily in the sense that the, the genetics that made that drone was a mixture of a random set of the, of the queen and a fixed set of the drone because there's only one set. So it's still a random set and a fixed set, same as it is with the with the workers, except that they only in the end it's well, let me think about this. No, she's laying an unfertilized egg. So they're all just a random set from from her. So okay, so no, they're not even related. They're not even related. Unless the it's the same. 
even if it was the an egg from the same drone well no it wouldn't it be, be it doesn't her. matter right. how many It'd drones she her. mated with all the drones are entirely from her side of the genetics right so that's the other thing that that you have to think about to, <laughs> to get it straight in your head right so it doesn't matter what drones she mated with all the drones are from her right in fact, this I... is a trick they used to do back when they were trying to get rid of all the dark bees and they were trying to italianize their bee yards is they would get an italian queen even if it was a virgin queen and it didn't matter who she, who she mated with um, if she was a pure italian queen all her drones were pure italian so you, you you could count on if you know if you could control the drones then pretty much you could get all drones that were italian based. right and i didn't have that straight in my head when i asked that question because it's the worker bees that are the fertilized egg and the drones are unfertilized right so, yeah, I, had, so, I had to think about it a second because sometimes you're not thinking about it. And right. Well, we were thinking about it in regards to the, the queen being fertilized and kind of I, I whatever we cleared it up. <laughs> so so there's there's people who will, who will say it another way. They'll say that a drone doesn't have a father because yeah. it doesn't. But it has a grandfather. Right. But it doesn't have a father because none of the none of that drone sperm is being used to create drones. Correct. So, yeah, it, it gets complicated. It's not at all how you picture it. But now here's where it starts to pay off. The research on this, as far as subfamilies, is that the more drones she mates with, the healthier the colony is. And part of it is because each subfamily will have its own set of characteristics. And if you have a wider variety of those characteristics, then, then uh, it, it contributes to the health of the colony. One of the, one of the early ones they studied was just how they ventilate. So if they have a lot of subfamilies, the ventilation tends to uh, vary because certain subfamilies get triggered to ventilate at a different point of heat or CO2 or whatever the, there's, there's both of those are trigger points that will cause them to ventilate. So what right? do you mean so, by ventilate? Well, they fan. Oh, gotcha, within the hive, okay. So I, this is a big this was a big thing back in Huber's day. They didn't believe that bees actually used oxygen because they thought it was impossible for there to be enough oxygen in there for the number of inhabitants that there were in that in that scap with that little tiny hole. Yeah. And all these, you know, 10, 20,000 bees in a scap. And uh, how could they possibly be breathing? There wouldn't be enough oxygen in there for them. So Huber proved that they actually do breathe, but he also proved that how they do it is is how they manage the ventilation. They suck the air in, they move it through the hive and they move it back out the door. And my, so the point of this research was that there's a certain trigger point for this subfamily that's different than the trigger point for this subfamily and different from the trigger point of this subfamily. So this subfamily will start fanning early and this subfamily will kick in if, it, if things are still too hot or too much CO2. And then this fam subfamily will kick in and then this subfamily will kick in and then oh, this nice. one will quit and then this one will quit and then this one will quit and then this one will quit as it cools off. And that works. But when they had just one set of, of drone, you know, a queen with just one drone uh, that she mated with, then there's only one subfamily and they would all start fanning at the same time. And then immediately it would get too cool and they would all stop. And then they'd all start because it got too hot and then they all stopped and there was no there was no smooth graduation of of oh we need to fan some more to fit, deal with this or we need to back off because it's starting to get too cool that, that was the first thing they studied but I, I think there's other behaviors that are the same way if you get a one subfamily that's hygienic that's all you need you got one hygienic subfamily in the whole colony and they'll do what the hygienic bees do and remove the damaged larva and and take care of the you know things Almost that need like to be taken care of. Individual crews within the hive, based off of their own genes. That's one way to look at it. Yeah. Interesting. So, and and, they, and like their that. motivation is different than another subfamily. So this one might be hygienic, and this one doesn't care two hoots about hygiene, but they're really hard workers as far as foraging or whatever. So you, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. This is this is this is where diversity actually pays off. You have these diverse um, subfamilies, and if you have one subfamily that'll cover this, and another subfamily that'll cover that, well, then everything gets covered. Which, yeah, which I think often gets labeled as you know the queen's the one you know 
providing those genes, but really she's kind of more like a, I don't know if the right word would be vector for um, the other families kind of funneling through her to um, participate within that hive. It's, Just, it's, it's both, but, but it, it's true. The, probably the drones contribute more towards behavioral things because one drone that has that behavior can set off that behavior in the whole colony, or at least set it off for that whole subfamily. But sometimes I think even for the whole colony, especially if it's something that's either uh, triggered by pheromones or it's triggered by, uh, by knowing how to do it. And then the other ones learn how to do it. I think there's a lot of learning that goes on in bee colony. We, I had quite a few conversations on this this last weekend with some people. And I think that's, you know, I, I don't know if you know the story of the, the this is this is a bird so I'll preface it with that there's a bird called the great tit that lives in a lot of places actually but the ones in England one day I think it was back in the 20s or so I'd, I'd have to look up the actual, actual date but one of them figured out how to pop the little paper cap that they used to put on the milk off they deliver the milk to people's porches and then they, one of them figured out how to pop this little paper cap off and drink the cream off the top of the milk and in a matter of a month, he had taught another one who had taught some more, who had taught some more. And every great tit in the entire UK was sucking the cream off of all the milk. They had to figure out a new way to deliver milk because they taught each other. And they'd never figured it out before. So you can't say it's instinctive because none, none of them right. have ever done it before. And then within a month, they'd all taught each other how to do it. Right. Uh, one of them taught another one and it spread. Well, I think bees do the same thing. I think one of them figures something out and the other ones watch him do it or watch her do it. And they figure out, oh, well, we could do that. And then they start doing it. And some of it too, I think, is they get motivated to find a way to solve a problem. Because uh, I, I have an observation hive and you often see them sitting and thinking what they're going to do. If you first put a package in and there's nothing in here yet, you can almost see them trying to decide where, where are we going to start the brood nest? Because they'll, they'll cluster up here in this corner for a little while. And then pretty soon they'll all move over to this corner for a little while. Then they'll all move down to this corner for a little while. Nobody's doing anything. Nobody's flying. Nobody's building anything. They're just all hanging out. And then they move over to this corner for a little while. And then finally they decide what to do. And then all of a sudden they just start drawing comb like crazy. And, and right in the middle or wherever it is they decided to go, they start drawing comb like crazy. And the queen starts laying like crazy. And they start raising brood like crazy. And then... It's like up until then, they weren't sure what they were going to do. They weren't just, I, I think they hadn't just even decided if they were going to stay. And if they were going to stay, where are we going to build the brood nest? So they're sort of, the, the hive mind is making up its mind. You know, right. the colony as a group is making a decision. And as a group, they make pretty smart decisions. As individuals, they're idiots. If you ever watch them, they, they, it's like they don't even know where they're going or what they're doing. And yet they get it done. You know, I've, I've watched a, house bee dragging a dead bee all over the inside of that trying to figure out how to get out to haul that dead bee out and obviously that house bee didn't even know the way out of the colony yeah. so um why why are you hauling it all over why don't you find the door first and then go and then go find a body to haul out but they're not <laughs> as busy smart. as a bee <laughs> michael they're just being busy <laughs> but but and if you watch it if you want an interesting first of all i think everybody ought to own a an observation hive because you will learn far more about bees in one day of watching an observation hive than you learn in 10 years of keeping bees in hives you really will because you can actually see what they do when when you open a hive they're not doing what they normally do they're all looking up at you going what's going on and so a few of them are still going about their business but nobody's going about their business the way they were before you opened it you know in a, in a you can tell that when you're looking at an observation hive because now you're just seeing them at their work and, Do you have and a, one, one that, one of the, that works better than another or that you would recommend? Oh, any, any, anything any will kind? do. But, okay. Um, I've, I've got a whole page on observation hives on my website. If you want to try and build your own it. on advice on the thickness between the glass that'll work the best and all that kind of stuff. But We'll add a um, link in the show notes to it. Okay. Um, and I, and I have a, I don't have a plan per se, but I actually have a description and a bunch of pictures at the bottom of okay. one that I made. That's a pretty simple one to make if you wanted to make one. But, but then the next thing you do is you, you catch a bunch of workers. <clears throat> actually, sometime when you're working it, take it out and try and purposely pick different age bees. You can tell the young bees because they're fuzzy, 
right? And so, so mark, mark them, get, get a, a, as many colors as you can get and mark individual bees, all those different colors, just, you know, one red bee, one blue bee, one green bee, one yellow bee, whatever, and try and pick them so they're ob they look different ages to you and they're doing different jobs. You can catch a few at the entrance that are, that are actually foraging and then get a bunch of them in there. And then just watch them. And then you can pick out an individual bee and see what that bee does. And you'll be amazed at how unmotivated and undirectional their life seems to be because they just kind of wander over and do a little bit of something. And then they just wander around like they don't know what they're doing. You know, what, what am I supposed to do next? And then they'll find something to do and they'll do that for a couple of minutes. And then they'll wander around like they're lost and they don't know where they're going. I mean, you look at a hive, you think they're really busy and they're getting a lot of work done, but you watch an individual bee, it's like they don't really know what they're doing. But here's another thing to consider when you're you're just talking about the this booming hive is always really packed. Uh, one of the reasons this, this, this is a cause and an effect. One of the reasons they're really packed is because they're successful. And one of the reasons they're successful is because they're really packed. Um, there's research out there that shows that the, the higher the density of bees, the more productive they are and the, and the healthier the colony is. Um, so one of the things you as a beekeeper have control over is the density of the bees because you're putting boxes on and taking boxes off. You get to control a lot of that density and you really want to keep that density. Um, well, I'd have to say that the density that's best depends on the time of year, but um, because actually during the flow, I can probably pile a bunch of empty boxes on and they'll fill them up so fast it's, it's scary. And I greatly reduce the density of the bees when I throw all those empty boxes on. But in the early buildup, they do much better if it's pretty high density. But on the other hand, if I let it get too high, then they're gonna, then they're gonna swarm on me. Right. So I'm trying, as a beekeeper, one of the things you're trying to do is maintain a high enough density that the colony is productive and healthy without getting it so high that they swarm. Uh, and then you might be able to cheat a little on that whole thing during the flow and throw some empty boxes on where there's really not that much density. They usually don't have any trouble staying healthy during a flow because they have so much income that they can, they can afford extra space and they can raise a lot of extra bees to handle the space. And they, they're, they're not, it just doesn't seem to be as big of an issue. But as soon as the flow's over, the density of bees starts to become important again because now they got all this honey and they're not raising a lot of bees because there's no flow and the small hive beetles are looking for any place they can take over. And so now the density of bees becomes critical again, but if I let it get too low, they're gonna get taken over by small hive beetles or wax moths or right. something. And so that density of bees, if, if I was to pick one, the number one thing that a beekeeper can do as far as manipulations to keep their colonies healthy, it's to maintain a good density of bees. Space management, that's your number one job. Now, right. sure, there's other things we could talk about like having a really good queen and things like that, but, uh, but as far as manipulating boxes, that's, that's your number one job is to keep that density where the bees are healthy. Now, do you do any, um, in regards to like how you manage your bees, do you do any like intentional splitting to uh, assist with uh, varroa mite loads? Or do you I, do it? I pay no attention stuff? whatsoever to varroa mites. You don't? Okay. I do nothing to try to manipulate varroa mites. Okay. Um, well, I do small cell and I and natural comb, both, although either one would do, but uh, mostly I guess I do both because I don't have time to build all the foundationless frames. So I bought a lot of PF 100 to 120s from Man Lake that are small cell as opposed to only doing natural cell, but pretty much I just, that's the only thing I'm doing other than breeding. I mean, I breed from the ones that are doing well, not, I don't count mites. I think, I think counting mites is misleading in the first place. Um, back when I got first got Russians, the Russians would tolerate huge mite loads and not die. Well, I think that's a trait that's important and I'm not sure I'm, I'm not sure I'm breeding for the right thing if all I do is count mites. I think really I wanna look at the overall, are, are they healthy, are they thriving, are they doing, doing well, or are they having problems? Right. I don't really need to count mites to know that. 
Well, and that's where like, so it, we talked about this before we started recording as we were having some technical problems, but um, you know, we talked, or I, I think I'd mentioned how like convoluted the conversation can get around a lot of topics, but I would say probably the most convoluted one is you know, for mites. And I know there's a lot of opinions, there's a lot of strong opinions one way or the other. Um, I personally am a uh, more of a natural. Um, I didn't test for any mites uh, in the first couple of years. We lost a fair amount of, of beehives, but we had quite a few that, that, um, that made it. And so I kind of started to look at this area, like, well, how can you go from a um what was the word conventional beekeeper mindset over to a treatment free and so i i've i've read a couple papers um i've watched a couple um presentations one by uh ralph ralph Buchler. i may be totally hacking up his last name but i think he was out of germany and um yeah, he really was, it was preaching in regards to how do you kind of get off of the chemicals and into a non-chemical situation. And, um, you know, they really looked at measuring mites. So you knew which ones kind of potentially were in problem, but, and I totally understand like what you're saying in regards to maybe we're looking at the wrong, wrong, um, measuring stick there. But his point was, if you've got some that are showing some positive signs of um, VSH, VSH um, that splitting them could provide them that natural brood break that a lot of times they experience within a tree hollow when the queen leaves, if it's not a double queen situation, which it sounds like some of these um, tree hollow beehives potentially have is a double queen situation where, you know, the hive is no longer happy with that queen. They raise one. And then when it's time, uh, they either let her take off or exterminate her. And so I just, you know, what, what are kind of your thoughts in regards to someone trying to go from a conventional without just going up, oh, we're just going to shut the off switch off unless that's what you recommend. Yeah, that's pretty much what I'd recommend. It's just a turn the <laughs> switch off. I mean, now it's an easier way you, to do it. Well, there's things you can do to, to mitigate your losses some. I mean, if you can get some local feral stock that's already surviving on their own, that's your best That's your best genetics for where you are, is genetics that are already surviving where you are. I realize some people are in places where there's so many beekeepers around that they don't think they can even find any bees that are surviving but the next best is to at least get some bees that are surviving without treatments <clears throat> that's not going to be your typical package from california or right. georgia or wherever right so you, there there are some treatment free beekeepers out there selling bees and packages selling queens and packages and uh granted they're usually sold out and you'll probably have to get in early to make sure you get some but but you can get some and you can get small cell bees, get small cell bees to start with and put them on natural comb. You got nice clean wax right off the bat instead of your contaminated wax from when you'd been treating. Um, Do you want to I, define I, like what a small cell um, bee is? I think a lot uh, of people should, don't really know what that means. Pr probably need a little bit of historical background. So back in the late 1800s, a guy named Badeau in Belgium um, was determined that he was going to try and get a bee that could work red clover um, because they had lots of red clover everywhere in the world and especially in Belgium. And honeybees can't reach the nectar. Only the, only the bumblebees can because honeybees don't have a long enough tongue. So he started with uh, bees that had a longer tongue. I think they were carniolans. And then he tried to enlarge them as much as he could by, by then foundation had been invented and he'd stretch the foundation uh, a little bit at a time and get it bigger. So he was getting bigger and bigger bees. He was trying to get as big a bee as he could possibly get. And his limit pretty much was about 5.6 millimeters, I think, cells was about as big a bee as he could get. But the bigger the cell is, the bigger the bee is. So... 
that was his research and there was a there were a whole lot of articles in all the bee magazines at the time as to whether it was a good idea or not to make the bees bigger but eventually everybody just decided well bigger bees must be more productive because they're bigger they have to be bigger is better so they uh they eventually the bee supply houses mostly standardized on about 5.4 millimeter cells so at 5.4 you could take any old swarm you caught that was normal sized bees and throw them on there and they'd build it and they'd use it. At 5.6, which he was doing, you, you, had to, you had to keep upsizing them to work up to that because the queen just, she'd lay nothing but drones in 5.6. Oh. And, and if she was just a small cell queen with small cell bees, they, they would just view that as drones. So anyway, they finally got them upsized to 5.4. So we have 5.4 for well yeah but no got them all the way to five six but five four you could do it in one one fell swoop you just throw them in there and and uh they build on it and they'd use it so that became the standard back in about the 30s and 40s at least and and a few of them were doing it as early as the 20s i think um so what is natural size well every b book you can find from huber up till um probably uh, anything before they started using foundation, uh, everybody would say it was five, five cells to an inch was a worker. And if it was less than that, then it was a drone, then it was a drone cell. And uh, that was pretty much the standard five cells to an inch. Well, it was more a rule of thumb than it was an accurate measurement. But as a as an as a rule of thumb, if you want to treat it as an accurate measurement, that's five point oh eight. Okay. Um, and the when they invented foundation, a lot of people were using smaller foundation because they get more bees per square inch. The Italians, according to Bedeau, were doing four point four millimeter cells on their foundation. Naturally. Back, no, that's just what they were doing for foundation. Oh, okay. And and he he thought that was terrible, but because <clears throat> he thought bees should be as big as possible. But um, what do they build naturally? Well, I've been measuring it for a while and I'd say it runs all the way from, typically the bees I have around here run all the way from about 4.6 millimeter to about 5.0 millimeter. And, the, and they build a variety of cells in the same colony. It's not like one colony may be more, tend more towards smaller and one may tend more towards larger, but pretty much they have a variety of cell sizes, which I've always wondered if that doesn't serve a purpose in the colony just like the subfamilies serve a purpose in the sense that a smaller bee can work flowers that a larger bee can't a larger bee can work flowers that the smaller bee can't the larger bee has a longer tongue and might be able to reach some nectar the little one can't and the little one can get into flowers that the big one can't so um it, it probably probably the bees are doing this on purpose i not accidentally but uh anyway they they do make a variety of cell sizes but all of them are smaller than 5.4 Okay. As far as workers. Now let's let's go to varroa mites and let's talk about Apis serrana. So Apis serrana is where varroa mites come from. Apis serrana builds cells between about 4.4 and 4.9 for the workers. And the drones are fairly consistent. They're right at 5.4. So a drone cell in Apis serrana is the size of a worker cell if you're using standard foundation. Okay. Now Varroa mites, there's evidence out there that varroa mites are both attracted to the larger cell and to the drone larva in particular. So they've done research where they put drone larva, well, you get a drone laying queen, you got drone larva in both worker cells and drone cells, and the varroa are attracted to both, but they're more attracted to the bigger cell. And the drones um, are what, like six, three, six, four ish, something like that? Well, if you buy drone comb, probably it seems to me that it's all over the map. If you just let them build their own comb, um, it seems like they've got. I, I sometimes see these huge drones that almost look like aliens. You're not <laughs> sure what they are at first because they were raised in such a big cell, and then you have them that are raised in in between cells that are that are fairly small. So they're they're kind of all over the map. But I, yeah, probably six point is probably a pretty good guess. I don't know. 